Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's stand and worship the Lord for his faithfulness to us. Sing, meet with me. Well, I'm so thankful to tell you guys that the Lord really moved, you may be seated, uh, in, the, in the lives of the women that were able to go to the simulcast for Priscilla Shire yesterday. If you went, would you just kind of raise your hand? 
all over, and there's some that are probably even still on their way or not able to come today, but we had 30 women go. Um, a few got sick, um, and, uh, but we still had 30 that came, and it was such an amazing time. Um, yes, praise the Lord. Wasn't it awesome? So I just wanted to let you guys know, and anyone who sponsored um, or gave money towards that, uh, towards just our women's ministry, we appreciate it. Um, all of us that were able to go, we were moved um, and inspired and challenged in our faith. What an amazing teacher of the word Priscilla is. So I encourage you to get any of her Bible studies and um, delve into scripture um, as, uh, as she would teach you. It's, it's awesome. So I also wanted to let you know, all you ladies and a few gentlemen, if you're able to help with a few things coming up, we have an awesome event that is going to be on June 3rd. It's a Friday in the summer, coming out of spring. Um, we're just going to just basically just love on the ladies of our church and also some ladies in our community. If you have a friend, um, a neighbor, your mom, your aunt, special lady in your life that you would want to bring to this, I believe in the Lord for 150 women at this event. I am just, I'm really hoping that that's what we get. I've got a team of ladies working with me on this and we are hoping for 150. Will you help us make that happen? First of all, yay, will you come yourself and bring some family members or a friend. Um, we're going to have speaker Kristen Ditchfield at this event. It's going to be lovely. I don't know, have, most of you, have, have you heard her speak? Yeah, she is so awesome. I'm so thankful she's here in our community. And uh, we're going to have her speak. We're also going to have an Olive Garden catered meal. Um, the ticket price is $15 for ladies seven years old and up. Uh, we're also going to have some door prizes, some fun, some worship. It's going to be a great night. So please keep that on your calendars. June 3rd, it's at 6.30 in the evening. Pastor Nick. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. For how many of you does Sunday morning go exactly as planned every week? Okay, Nolan in the back, he says it goes exactly how he wants it to every single week. Well, it's the same for our family. As you can see, we're, we're, we're down a few as well on the praise team. We've got some folks who got sick. Um, and I know for me, I was rushing out the door because Courtney was leading praise and worship. I was trying to get Max out of bed. I had to wake him up early. But I say all that to say, you don't have to come to church to gather with the family of God with everything tied up neatly and nicely. You don't have to come with all your ducks in a row. Sometimes, and it seems especially on Sundays, that ends up being the most stressful day, getting out the door or someone cuts you off or who knows what happens on your way here. But I do know that we have an enemy who's doing everything he can to try to quench what God would do when we gather. So I encourage you, if you came today and everything wasn't exactly as you had planned, or if you came today and everything wasn't as nice and neat as you hoped it would be, or maybe you came today with great burdens, stresses, maybe you're here today and you have great grief. Whatever, whatever it is that you're coming with, my, my encouragement to you is that you have a God who knows every detail of your life. He loves you in the midst of every detail. And, and that's why he calls you to come worship him. It's reflecting on who he is and all he's done for you. And he, and he wants you to uh, connect with the family of God. And he wants you to sing your praises to him. And he wants you to dig into his word as we, as we gather. So if you're a visitor here with us today... I would encourage you to reach in the seat back in front of you. There's a little visitor card you can fill out. And that, as I say every week, if for our folks who are here every week, they know I say this or someone does. We just want to connect with you. We want to be able to minister to you. But we can't do that if we don't know how to contact you. So please take that card, fill it out. Let us know how we can serve you. Put it in the offering plate. You've got a few minutes now before the offering plate's going to come by. Put it there so that we can follow up, give you a call, meet with you spend time with you, love on you, whatever that might look like for your context of life, we want to be there for you. So please do that for us. All right, I've got a couple of announcements. We're going to then dis dismiss our kiddos, and then we will take up our offering. We have a change coming on Wednesday nights. Many of you know about this. Awana is ending. I believe Awana has uh, technically one more uh, normal uh, Awana night. I guess it's going to be, is it water night? I think it's water night coming up this Wednesday. So wear your water stuff. 
I'm looking forward to that. Um, we also then have on May 4th, Nolan likes that date, May the 4th, okay. Um, <laughs> We also have, on May 4th, the Awana Awards night. Now, we're going to do something a little bit different for that, okay? How many of you, raise your hand just, for, just so I can see you. How many of you normally come on a Wednesday night? Yeah, okay. So, what I'm asking for you to do is still come that Wednesday night for Awana Awards night. What we're going to be doing is we're going to kick off our sort of summer fellowship dinners on that night. Uh, what, we're, what we're hoping to do this summer, beginning on May the 4th, um, is to have a, just a real community feel on Wednesday nights where we eat dinner together, we fellowship, we won't be offering child care. Um, we're asking you to come and bring your kids, bring your family. I'm asking you to come and hold my babies um, on Wednesday night. And I think I can speak for the Dunhams too, okay? Um, we just want to bring you guys together and fellowship. There will be a, a devotional time where myself or Pastor Dave will teach from the Word for a little bit. But we want to gather as a community of God, encouraging each other, getting to know each other, hearing each other's stories, um, obviously eating together, and uh, just spending time together. So that's what we're going to start on May 4th. But as we're eating and, and, and spending time together, we're also going to have the Iwana Awards Night. And I want as many of you to be there as possible so that you can affirm and encourage uh, these kiddos and also these leaders who are investing their time for young people to learn the Word of God. We need you guys there to come out and, and, and applaud them. Come out and encourage them. Come out and, and, and show your support for them. And then also connect. All right, that is starting May 4th. So I hope that you guys will be there. All right, uh, now I'm going to go ahead and dismiss the kids. You guys can head over with Miss Amy over here and, and Mr. Chuck's coming up. You can head over to Kids Connection. And I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. And my encouragement for you guys this morning is this. If you are moved by the gospel of God, if you're moved by the grace of God this morning, just to give with a cheerful spirit. I'm not going to stand up here and go, give more or, or give a whole lot more, anything like that. But just give as God leads you because he's been so graceful with you. That's what Paul teaches in the word, that we give because God has given to us. And so I just encourage you to give back whatever you whatever you can, whatever you will, whatever God moves you to do. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for being such a graceful God. I'm thankful, Lord, that um, no matter what we bring to the table this morning, whether it be hardship, pain, grief, uh, stresses, um, sins, uh, maybe accomplishments and blessings, God, that no matter what we bring, Lord, your love remains steadfast. It doesn't waver when we do. I'm thankful, Lord, that your grace is uh, everlasting, uh, even when we are impatient, even when we uh, continue to stumble, you've been so good to us. And so God, I pray as, as we give back today, Lord, that you'd be honored in it, that we'd be moved to give with a joyful spirit. God, that you'd use the gifts that are given to uh, further the ministry of this local church family, that we'd use it to carry the gospel, that we'd use it to encourage hearts, uh, that we'd use it to love on people. I just pray that your hand would be on all of that, Lord. And um, God, just that you would be glorified and honored, that you'd be smiling as we give back, and that we would do it with a great cheer. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My worth is not in But in the costly wounds I 
satisfied in Him alone. As summer flowers we fade and die, fame, youth, and beauty hurry by. But life eternal calls to us at the cross. I will not boast in wealth or might, or human wisdom's fleeting light, but I will boast in no
All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep, that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord.
ashes cleft for me let me hide myself in thee amen all right you may be seated let's pray together Lord, as we are about to come before your word and, and listen to Pastor Dave teach us, Father, I pray that we would come with humble hearts, a willingness to receive uh, from you what you have for us today, that we would feast on scripture and be nourished and, and built up in it, um, and Father, again, that you would just accomplish through your word what you want, so I pray you'd speak through Pastor Dave, and may we humbly uh, submit ourselves to his teaching and, and to your teaching, Lord, through him. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. If you have the word, turn to John chapter 21. I'm just going to read a few verses before Pastor Dave comes to, to teach us this morning. This is a, a passage or a, a context in which Jesus is having breakfast by the sea with his disciples. Starting in verse 15. John 21, 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. You know, there's a lot of animal imagery in the Bible. Jesus is portrayed as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Satan is a serpent. A dragon, a lion, hungry, looking for its prey. Hypocrites are called vipers. False teachers are wolves. A wicked ruler is a charging bear in Proverbs. In Daniel, Greece is a speedy leopard or a one-horned goat. Persia is a lopsided bear or a two-horned ram. Rome is the ten-horned monster with iron teeth. In the New Testament, new believers are fish to be caught by the disciples, the fishers of men. Jesus wanted to gather Jerusalem under his arms like a hen gathers her chicks. And in the book of Revelation, we see the four living creatures have four faces, three of which are a lion, an ox, and an eagle. So why does the Bible use su such animal imagery to portray spiritual truth? Well, it doesn't tell us why, but we can sort of speculate. One thing is that animals have a mystery about them. They fascinate us as we watch them and what they do and what they're capable of doing. So sometimes their, their strength is greater than ours. They can jump higher and run faster. Or they have abilities that we don't have. They can fly. They can stay underwater for long periods of time. And then there's a wildness about them. So they're, they're powerful, they're uniquely gifted, they uh, have a mystery about them and they're wild, but none of those things apply to the animal the Lord uses to refer to us. Sheep. There's no great mystery with sheep. They don't have any great strength, they have no special abilities, and they're not even wild. They only exist as domesticated animals. But behaviorally, they are closest to humans than any other animal. Now, physiologically, they're, we're closer to pigs. And anatomically, we're closer to chimpanzees. But when it comes to behavior, we're a lot like sheep. So I went on the Internet this last week, and I typed in sheep behavior and read a bunch of articles about sheep behavior from non-Christian websites, just farmers telling you, how do you herd a bunch of sheep? And there were some negative traits and some positive traits. And I'll just read them to you, and you can decide if this sounds like us or not. Sheep, they will not act contrary to their nature unless they are made to do so. They are not bashful and can be very aggressive when they want something. They get in squabbles constantly with each other. 
They instinctively are fearful. They do not like change. They have no depth perception. They tend to move in the opposite direction of the shepherd. They have no effective natural defenses because they're not swift and they don't see well. They have no sense of direction. They are prone to stray so they get lost very easily. They are easily disturbed and distracted and they have a good memory so they hold grudges and they're not intelligent. Now, this wasn't from a preacher's site preaching at his church. This was a farmer's site telling young farmers how to deal with sheep. But they have some positive things too. They have a great sense of hearing. So they respond to the spoken word. Their most powerful instinct is to flock. They have a a propensity to follow other sheep, which is why they tend to get lost. They seek light and they seek high ground. They like routine. They will respond to the shepherd. And again, they have good memories. So if you give them good memories, they retain those as well. They are social animals. They do not like seclusion. They move best on a flat surface, and they move best in small groups. They are affectionate, and one of the, one of the um, sites said they have loving eyes, and they love to lick hands of humans. And they are domesticated, means they can be organized and controlled, but they cannot exist without a shepherd. So in in that list of positive and negative behavioral traits of sheep, you can see maybe that's one reason why the Lord chose sheep to describe his children and to describe what we are as a church. We're in the middle of a series on recovering the identity of the church. And we've talked about it being a a uh, a family. No, we haven't done that one yet, have we? What have we done so far? Have we done an assembly? Well, I think it's on the top of your outline sheet on the back of your bulletin. You can tell me. But this is the... Thank you. A body. And today is going to be a flock. And the reason we're choosing a flock is because the Lord Jesus chose that. And one reason he chose sheep is because of who he is. And we had two passages that stated that. He is the good shepherd. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And he said, we are the sheep of his pasture. So one reason we are called sheep is because our Savior is the good shepherd. Another reason is because he is the Lamb of God. He was the Lamb of God before there were any sheep. He was the Lamb of God before the foundation of the world. He's the Lamb of God who's be slain that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, which means we will be like him, so we will be sheep. So there's theological reasons, there's practical reasons, there's organizational reasons, but the word flock and the word sheep are a metaphor for how the church is to function together. So I wanted to look at that. If you turn on your, back your outline sheet, you'll see some um, information you can fill in as we go through this message. What can we learn about ourselves and our church as we look at the metaphor of a flock? The first one is the flock will fracture without a shepherd. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus had been preaching in the synagogues and the villages, and the Bible says, the sight of the people moved him to pity. They were like sheep without a shepherd, harassed and helpless. In Matthew 26, Jesus said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For as it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And as these websites I went to uh, made very clear, sheep cannot survive on their own. They would not survive in the wild. They only survive within the context of a shepherded flock. So the flock will fracture without a shepherd. That's why um, in Acts chapter 20, the Bible reminds us of this. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. This is Paul talking not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. So the flock has a tendency to fracture unless it is 
drawn together and held together by the shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course we see he has under shepherds, those who are assigned then to shepherd the flock. If not, it naturally fractures. People are always trying to divide or split a flock because of programs or preferences or personalities or doctrine. And every church here in Sarasota and every church probably in America has had to deal with that tendency for the flock to grow and then fracture off because of program deficiencies or program differences or preferences or personalities or because of, uh, of doctrinal questions that come up. And Paul said, there will be some who will come in your midst for that very purpose, to draw away some to follow them. So we should keep that in mind as a flock. If God wants us to stay together and we have a tendency to fracture, we must make sure that we are true to the shepherd. The next thing is the flock must then be familiar with the shepherd. In that same passage where Paul wrote to uh, the pastors that savage wolves are going to come in and people are going to rise up within you to draw disciples away, he says this, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. We need to be familiar with the shepherd because he is the one who purchased us. We are members of the flock because of the shepherd who paid the price for us. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I am known by them. The greatest call of the church, the greatest task of the church, the, the greatest um, opportunity for the flock members is to know the Lord Jesus. And today's marketing techniques and aspects of the church, you often drive around town, you'll see bumper stickers that say, I love my church. And I think that's a neat thing in some ways, and I, it, it's always neat to think somebody loves their church, but it also bothers me a little bit because we tend to love our church or love our pastor and not know the shepherd. What we ought to be saying is we love the Lord Jesus Christ and we belong to a flock. We belong to to a church but there's so many other loves that can detract us and distract us away from the shepherd the flock must be familiar with the Lord Jesus Christ and I would ask you how familiar are you with him you might know your church really well you might know your core beliefs you might be able to recite your mission statement but do you know the Lord Jesus Christ that is the most important thing there's nothing more important for the church to do than to introduce people to Jesus, to instruct and educate people about the Lord Jesus and for the flock to know the Lord personally. And that takes interaction with his word and, and time and prayer. And as we're going to see throughout this entire series, it requires that we do it together. All these terms that the Bible gives us for the church, they all have one thing in common, that they are units put together together to cooperate with one another and encourage each other. And on the bottom of your outline sheet, you're going to see that the definition today for church incorporates that term flock that we're going to state at the end. But we are all supposed to be drawing people to know Jesus, to know Him, to follow Him. The third thing is the flock must feed. It's the passage that Nick read, and I want to read it to you again if you don't mind. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And I know those of you have heard sermons on that, and you know the word there is a form of the word agape. Do you have high esteem and respect for the value of who I am, the Lord Jesus? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. And the Greek word there is arneon, and it means like a household pet. Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Again, the word agape. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And he changes the word. And it's the Greek word probata. It's the word we get probate from. And it means property. As when you go to probate court to divide the inheritance. Jesus said, feed my property. Feed my loving household pet but they are also my property because I purchased them with my blood. 
He said to them the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he changes it to the word phileo because that is the word that Peter was responding with. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. So the call to Peter and the call to every pastor ever since that day is to feed the sheep and feed them the word of God. There's nothing more important for a pastor than to teach and preach the word of God, to feed those who gather at the table of the flock. And so my question to you would be, what is your diet? If a flock has to feed, what are you feeding on? And how often do you eat? I guarantee you, you're eating every day. And you're eating all day. You are gathering in information and philosophies and viewpoints and principles and precepts all day long. Where are you getting those things from? There are so many things bombarding us with philosophies of the world and attitudes we should have and things that we should treasure and morals that we should cling to coming from all different sources. The sheep are to feed on the word of God. Is that your diet? And who's feeding you? You know, sometimes when you think about the things that we listen to and the things that we watch on TV and movies and who's producing those and making those, it makes you pause for a minute and ask yourself, should we be eating from this table? Who is feeding you? Well, here at church, we gather together once a week on Sundays and on Wednesday nights for those who come and then in small groups throughout their week in homes to feed on the Word of God. So that's why it's important when you come on Sunday to, to bring your Bible with you. And then you might have it on your phone or electronic device, but to bring the Word of God with you so when it's opened and read, you can read it yourself and see it with your own eyes and you feed and you listen and you absorb and you respond. The flock must feed. The flock's main purpose is not to go out and serve the flock must feed so that it can do the tasks assigned to it. If you're not feeding, you'll be a weak sheep. And if a flock is not fed on the word of God, it will be a weak flock. Next, the flock must follow. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now, they follow Christ as an example and as a leader and as our Savior, of course, but he also then assigns the church an under-shepherd, a, a, a gifted man to preach and teach and lead the sheep, and sheep are to follow. And we heard one of the traits of a sheep is to go the opposite direction of the shepherd. That's why the shepherd in the Old Testament and New Testament had a rod and a staff, two devices with which to direct, protect, correct the sheep as they are constantly prone to strain. A sheep might have the very best intention of going the right direction, but if the sheep in front of him walks off this way, the sheep will follow and go. And the shepherd has to constantly be corralling the sheep in. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 through 4, Peter writes this to pastors. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Then he makes this promise, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So a flock must follow. We follow the shepherd, and then we follow the under shepherds. And the Bible puts us together as a flock. One flock is uh, the passage that Brooke read. We are one giant gigantic flock under one shepherd were also local flocks under under shepherds so the flock must follow to do that the flock must focus in Luke chapter 12 verse 29 through 31 Jesus says do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink nor have an anxious mind for all these things the nations of the world seek after and your father knows that you need these things but seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. 
So we're to live in such a way that we reflect our king, that we reflect the principles and the morals and the philosophies of the king. It's a dangerous thing when a flock allows the world to dictate to the flock what the flock should be doing. The flock should be following the shepherd. The flock should be reflecting the principles of the kingdom. The flock should be seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not cultural appeal, not societal impact, but to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We must have a clear focus and the principles of the kingdom can be summarized by the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. What if we as a flock sought to live out those principles in everything that we do? Some of the other things that we focus on would automatically begin to be produced if we were seeking first the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Because when you're seeking the things of God, they produce the things that God wants you to have. And for a flock, a local flock, for a church family, an ecclesia, a called out group, a, a body to pursue the objectives that God has laid before us, we must first focus on seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. To do that, the flock must have faith. In that passage, Luke 12, Jesus continues, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We must have faith. The church often, the flock often, and the sheep often focus on things other than faith because we are challenged by a natural instinct towards materialism, a, a natural propensity for fear. We have a desire to want to control things. That's why we like to have routines that we've chosen. We like the order that it brings. We like to have the sense of that we are in control because we are averse to risk. We don't want to risk what we have, what we've accumulated. We don't want to risk our dreams and our ambitions for something else that we don't quite understand yet. And we are drawn towards the familiar. All those things are contrary often to what faith is supposed to be. Faith is, as Jesus said here to his disciples, do not fear, little flock. It's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In other words, don't focus on these 70, 80, 100 years you have here on earth. Focus on what God has for you, and it's his pleasure to give to you. The splendors of heaven are yours. So as you accumulate and you accrue things and possessions and reputations, feel free to distribute it to bless others because you have what's coming to you is coming in the future. Well, that takes faith. That takes faith to take your money and put it over here. It takes faith to, to contribute to the welfare of a flock. It takes faith to not worry. It takes faith to say, I'm not going to... Um, get anxious over the decisions I have to make this week or the challenges facing me. I'm going to believe that God will provide. That is a challenge for every single one of us. And the Bible says the flock must have faith. In Romans, the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. And then he clarifies that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Your faith is not enhanced by reading positive, um, you can do it, posters. Your faith is not enhanced by going to a life enhancement seminar that tells you you can do it. Your faith, spiritual faith, is grown and strengthened by the Word of God. So as we feed on the word of God, we're feeding our faith and then we have to direct our faith towards the Lord and not towards the other things that we often direct them towards. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes to Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we have the nature of sheep, which is to be fearful, to conflict with those around us, to fight for what we want, yet the Bible says God has given us something different. Love, power, and a sound mind to think the way he wants us to think. And then lastly, the flock must flock. That's why we're called a flock. You don't call something a flock if all the sheep are running different directions. You call that a denomination. You call that politics. You call that whatever you want to call it, but it's not a flock. A flock is the group that is together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25, the writer writes, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling, which is our first message on this, the called out ecclesia, the called out ones who gather together. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we are to be flocking together that we might exhort and stir up good works. Knowing that we have the tendency to follow other sheep, it's very important for you as a sheep to be going the right direction because somebody might be following you. One of the things that I read on the websites is that a sheep that is leading other sheep astray doesn't know that he's going astray. He's just walking off while somebody is following behind. What if somebody's following you and you don't know it? Somebody's watching your choices. Somebody's watching your preferences. Somebody's listening to your words. Somebody's watching your habits. And they're following you as an example, yet you were never told. Now, if somebody said to you, Joe, I'm going to follow you. What you do, I'm going to do. You would probably straighten up and fly right and make sure you're going the right direction. Well, assume that somebody is following you. It might be somebody you don't even know. It could be a family member. It could be a friend. It could be a church member. But the chances are very good that somebody is following you if you're in a flock. So you must make sure that you are following the Lord. Because we're told to flock together, to provoke, to stir up each other, to love and do good works. If you look at the very bottom of your outline sheet, I'd like you to say this definition slowly with me. The recovering the identity of the church using the term flock. And you read it out loud with me if you don't mind. The church is a group of believers. By out loud, I mean like with your mouth speaking. <laughs> It's not on the screen. It's on the bottom of your bulletin. It's at the top. Thank you. It's at the top. All right, let's try that again. The church is a group of believers of all ages chosen to live together as a flock to worship the Father, follow the Son, walk in the Spirit, love each other, teach the Word, and reach the lost. And there's one thing that's true about a flock is a flock grows through the sheep reproducing more sheep. That's part of the call of the church is to evangelize. The Lord gives us the fruit. The Lord calls and the Lord reawakens and the Lord re-energizes and the Lord converts and the Lord calls his children, but he does it through the sheep. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature because he died for every creature and he's calling every creature. And by that, it means people. Well, we as sheep are to be focused on how we can produce other sheep. And then the flock grows. If the church is a flock, and the question we'd ask yourself is, um, are you part of fracturing the church? Are you familiar with the shepherd yourself? Do you know the shepherd? Are you feeding on the food that he's provided, the word of God? Are you following the shepherd? Are you focused with faith? And are you flocking together with the purpose of stirring up love and good works in the flock? 
The church is many things in the United States today, and it's many things across the world today. I saw a preacher on TV last night who's a personal friend of mine, and he spent his entire program, an hour-long program, trying to awaken the church to what is happening to the church across America. His name is Leslie Hale. If you ever watch the show, he's just a, a, a Christian troublemaker. And he had on a baseball cap last night that said, Leslie lowers the boom. And he always wears a baseball cap when he does his little TV show. And he was talking about the health, wealth, and prosperity of the church today and how far it has drifted from the, the truth of the gospel and faith in God. And it was a, it was a disturbing program. Uh, it was an interesting program, but it was also frightening as he accounted what's happening all over the world, not just in American churches, Latin American churches, Asian churches, where the promise of just give and God's going to give back to you a miracle. And God's going to give to you money. And God's going to answer your prayer, but it's going to cost you some money and the money has to come to this ministry. And he was denouncing that last night. And I would say for the flock of God, as, as the church is being redefined all across America, it's not really that complex. We have three or four more metaphors we're going to look at in the weeks ahead. We are a flock. We are an ecclesia. We are a, a body. And we're going to find out in the next few weeks where a few more things that illustrate we're interconnected to each other for the purpose of worshiping the Father, following the Son, walking in the Spirit, teaching the Word of God, loving one another, and reaching the lost. And we're to do it together. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've sent us the great shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. And through your Spirit and through your Word, you have given us rebirth as your sheep and the sheep of your pasture. And you've called us to follow the shepherd and to feed on your word and to flock together as friends and family connected because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for our church and we call ourselves Faith Baptist Church in terms of our, our pattern is faith and our doctrine is Baptist, but Lord, we are simply a flock of the shepherd, Jesus Christ. We ask you to help us to focus and to walk by faith. Father, if there's anybody here in our midst today who has never acknowledged Jesus Christ as their shepherd, they have never surrendered themselves to be born again into the flock, be made alive as a sheep. May they right now, right where they're seated, in their heart, confess the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Receive that gift of salvation in the presence of the Holy Spirit and be reborn from a goat to a sheep. And then, Father, I pray for our church family. You'll help us to flock together with a purpose with intensity, with the right heart and the right attitude to stir up and minister to one another. Now for just a moment, let me give you a, a few moments just to ponder the words of this message and respond in your heart as God may have touched you. Whatever prayer would be the appropriate one for you to speak to God now, please feel free to take this moment to talk to him. While you're praying, let me ask each one of you to prayerfully consider asking the Lord to use you to bring sheep into the flock. Maybe you have a friend, a co-worker, an acquaintance, a fellow student, family member, who has yet to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. What greater purpose could there be in life than for the Lord to use you 
to draw that person to salvation. Ask the Lord to help you add sheep to the flock. And Father, we thank you for this time to pray together, to hear from your word and to sing, and to flock together as a family to fellowship and minister with each other. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Am I on here? Okay. All right, got a few announcements for you guys before we wrap up and head off to our Sunday school classes. The first is May 28th. We're having a spring cleaning day, just actually morning, 9 a.m. to noon. Would love for you guys to come out. We know it's right around that holiday time, but if you're in town and can spare a few hours on a Saturday morning, be a big help to get some things spruced up here on our campus. Uh, next Friday night, our teens are having a midnight mayhem. I guess we'll call it an activity. Um, and it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, Grace is up there just really amped about it. Uh, adult here to volunteer to mentor a teen, to volunteer to get plugged in somehow with, uh, with what we're doing and trying to minister um, to our young people here at the church. Um, listen, we meet every Friday, and that's great. And we gather together here on Sunday, and that's great. But a lot of the real work and real growth and fruit comes from mentoring and that intimate discipleship. But we need people to do that. If you're interested in doing that, would you please see me, call me, email me, text me. It doesn't matter. Just let me know you're interested, and I will get you connected. Uh, we can meet and, and go from there. Um, Sunday school, right after this. Take a look at that. I'm not necessarily going to read through everything, but take a look at that up there. We would love to have you plug in with us right now before you go to lunch. We meet together for about 45, 50 minutes for some further study and discussion. I'll be upstairs with our teens. Um, I know there's a great ladies class that I believe meets over in the media chapel. Uh, We've got Jim Buckley's class that he's been telling me about kind of what they're digging into, and it's really great stuff. And then PD will be in here talking about end times. Um, but I just don't want anyone to miss out on that opportunity if you get the chance to go. Um, we also need nursery workers. That's all I'm going to say. I got little ones. I love that we have faithful people to love on them in nursery. But we need more of you if you could do it. Uh, it would be awesome. I promise you, and I think Phyllis will say a big amen, it will bless you to do it um, if you'd volunteered to, to love on those, on those little ones there.